Good evening. Uh, I hope you welcome to the stage the filmmaker, Jean Sivonsevois, part by Jordan, and the the retreat, one of the main EMS consultants, George Contreras. Ooh la la. So let's talk about this light-hearted fair that everyone's come out for on Thursday evening to see. Um, congratulations, all three of you, on this. I feel like all three of you can get congratulated on this because there's, uh, I've never done any time as a paramedic or an EMT, but there's a sense of uh, you are there immersion and authenticity to this that um, I have to imagine that you played a big part in that in terms of getting these guys kind of up to speed and being able to play a convincing, <laughs> convincing paramedic team uh, on screen. Yes. <laughs> so, I, you know, that's one of the key things with Drew, myself, and a lot of the EMTs and paramedics from White Talk Hospital um, is the fact that we really wanted to, you know, translate that to Ty and to uh, Sean, the fact of you know, whatever we can do to help them make it look authentic, that's what we really wanted to drive the point home. And, you know, credits, kudos to them for doing a lot of ride-alongs. Uh, long hours, uh, many months, uh, to kind of get the feel for it, and then outside of that, doing the training. You know, we met on weekends, evenings, just getting those skills, the things that kind of look like they actually know what they're doing. It's because we of don't. Their, be, <laughs> because of their hard work and the effort they put into it. And, uh, you know, credit to, to Jean, because I met him in 2018, and, you know, since then he was doing countless hours of writing because he wanted to get to see what it felt like. Let's take one quick step backwards here. So you get turned on to Shannon Burke's book through a producer, right? What was yep. it about the book that made you want to kind of explore this whole notion of like graveyard shift paramedics and the EMS? I think I really loved the book because it was really based on the Shannon experience. And he, he, he used to be a, a young paramedic, but uh, Ty is uh, playing in a movie in the 90s in Harlem. So I, I really loved the authenticity of the book. And I thought only a paramedic could have write this book, you know, and I thought it was really interesting in the term of doing something very realistic, a movie re very realistic, but I didn't want to shoot like 90s because you have to recreate everything, we didn't have the budget. It's a different story and I thought it was more interesting to uh, portrait New York these days. I moved in New York 15 years ago now and, and I'm leaving Bushwick, bed -Stuy and stuff and, and I thought Bushwick, East New York was really interesting to portrait in a movie because it's changing, you know, uh, as probably many of you know, you know. And and I thought when I came 15 years ago that it was a good way, you know. I mean, I really wanted to shoot a movie here. And then the paramedic, and the, it's a kind of subject. You can get into the city, you can get into the different houses and stuff, and you discover kind of the backstage. <laughs> and then, uh, no, I think it's a good way to get into the, into the, the heart of the city. And I was lucky to meet with the White Cough Hospital, you know, 2008, when we started the researches, and uh, they allowed me to do the ride along. So it was great to be in the back of the ambulance and to, uh, to be immersed and trying to understand, you know, the reality of this job, the reality of New York City, the backstage of, of the city, kind of, you know. The, the, you don't really see that, you know, until you really uh, get in inside the ambulance. We see this ambulance, you see most of the people, you know, this in the street, you know, they don't want to hear the siren. And they don't want to see as well, you know, what's going on inside these guys. So I hope the movie show, you know, what's going on inside the ambulance. Uh, I don't know if we have any actors in the in the audience tonight. You should all be so lucky that you have a film you would have a filmmaker who liked your work so much he'd fly to Utah to come interview you for a part. What was it about um, Ty's work that made you go across country to try and convince him to do this? And what was the pitch that he gave you? He was going from LA to New York, let's be honest, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, if New York, Utah, you were like, yeah, shooting in the night, clerk. I said, I need to meet him in person because if I send an email or call him, he's going to, like all the actors, you know, I need to read the script, I need to think about it and stuff. So I said, yeah, let's meet Ty, you know. I don't know, it, not one film in particular, but all, all his films, you know? And I 
when I read the book, I said, yeah, Thai would be perfect, you know, he would be the right age. And I thought, like, I really like him as an actor, and I thought, yeah, it would be, uh, I don't know, it, it, for me, it was one of condition of the film, even with the production, I said, I want to do it if it's Thai. If it's not Thai, I don't know who could play this part, honestly. And it was the same with Sean. Sean, it took, like, more, uh, many years to convince him, because he didn't want to do it first. But Thai, yeah, it was uh, an evidence. Uh, that I really wanted him, and I don't regret, you know, night. And you know, it's always the same. When you do a movie, you can't imagine someone else, you know? Right. <laughs> it's, you know, in, but uh, yeah, and uh, it was a tough movie to shoot, you know, we shoot 23 days, and so we didn't have these sh chairs, you know, only here, but on set we never had. I never had, I'm lucky tonight to have this kind of <laughs> director <laughs> chair, but <laughs> it was not like that on set, you know? So, and it was game for everything, you know, yeah, it was great to uh, work with Terry. Did you did you know John Stefan's work previous to this? Did you what was it that convinced you to sign on for this? Well, I not no, I didn't. I wasn't familiar with his work before this project, and uh, I usually, you know, when you're working on a film, especially when you're there every day, it's, you don't really have time to do anything else other than just focus on the job at hand. So you, it's you know you typically get like a tunnel vision, and <clears throat> I was shooting this film in Utah, and I typically don't want to you know, speak to other directors or look at other projects or read any other scripts. It's confusing. Yeah, you know, you're kind you of in just, a mindset. Yeah, you want to focus on the, th you know, the thing you're doing and do that 100%. And I said, oh, I'll watch, his, I'll watch his film on the weekend. And I remember watching his films and I was like, man, this, yes. W yeah, when can I meet this guy? You know, I was like really blown away by Jean Stefan's work and, um, you know, so lucky to be sitting here and to be able to work with you. Uh, I, uh, I think... Yeah, the idea of, as you said it, you know, getting into this world through, through you know, uh, into New York through the eyes of medics and through their experience and really getting into the medics as well um, through his style of filmmaking was such an exciting, appealing uh, uh, concept to me. And, and uh, yeah, I think the, the minute we met, you know, hit it off. And that was a long time ago. That was 2018. So we've been trying to make this movie for a really long time, uh, six years, yeah. Yeah, what did you guys do between 2018 and, and shooting in 2022? Like, I know there was a lot of training. I want to hear about the ride-alongs, like the kind of stuff that you guys saw. I'm told that a couple of incidents that you actually saw while you were doing the ride-along sort of made it into the script eventually. Walk me through that whole experience from all three of your perspectives. It's always long, you know. I mean, you, you, you have a cast to finance the movie, you know. Who, who's going to be the movie star? with Ty, you know, so Sean first told me I really want to work with you. I knew him a little bit before, and when I got the script, you know, and the project, I said, uh, Sean, you would be perfect. And uh, he said, like, we, t we talked over the phone, and he said, but I don't want to act anymore. So it was 2018. And, uh, but uh, if you come to LA, you know, it would be good, it would be interesting to meet. I said, okay. And then I called him a week after, you know, I said, oh, by the way, I'm coming to LA, so can we meet, you know, can we get a coffee? And uh, he said, but how long are you going to stay? I said, I'm going to stay a week. Where are you going to stay? I said, I'm go to the hotel. You can stay at my house if you want. Uh, we, like this, we can talk, you know. So I stay a week uh, with Sean in his house, trying to convince him. He read the book, had the script, I was pushing, and, uh, and then he said, okay, I don't want to act anymore. I said, okay, you got that, you know. <laughs> he said, maybe I'm going to do it one condition. I said, oh, okay, at least, you know, I didn't waste my time. He said, okay, let's shoot the suicide scene the first day of the shooting with a gun and real bullet. I said, okay, so maybe I won't have, like, <laughs> so maybe we're going to lose Sean even, uh, yeah, the first day of the shooting it might be tough. So, But then he helped me, you know, to cast the film and stuff. But for some reason, you know, I really wanted for Sean to be in a movie. So we had different cast after, and, uh, and then the COVID happened, you know. So we are all locked, you know, for two years. So that's how also between 2018 and 2024, you know, uh, and then everything stopped, and uh, and we lost the financiers, and we had uh, and another producers. And then after the COVID, I called back Sean. I said, Sean, now because during the COVID, he worked with the LA uh, uh, fire department. He did with his NGO, you know, some vaccination. So I said, now right. I think you're ready. You know, you did it for you trained all these people, and you were working with these people for uh, months. So I think you're ready for the movie. He said, yeah, okay, now let's do it. 
I want to do it because I think he's so, so, and he worked with all these guys, all the paramedics, you know, in uh, Los Angeles. And, uh, and he understood, you know, that during this front line, we all uh, lived, you know, during the, the pandemic. I think it, it became also something important for him to, to do, you know, this part. You want to talk about the training? How long did it take you to feel like you could convincingly portray an EMT on screen? Day 23 of shooting. <laughs> <laughs> right um, before he called, that's a wrap. Well, yeah, no, we were super lucky to find the team at Wyckoff Hospital early on, and these guys, you know, took us in with open arms. And, yeah, we were doing Ride Along since 2018 because we thought we were going to make the movie then. We thought we were going to make the movie in 2018, and then we were going to make it in 2019, and then in 2020, and the pandemic hit. And so I was taking trips to New York. He was getting into his old process, doing the Ride Alongs, and just, you know, pulling people in and developing this world. And we were developing the script in the meantime, and I was taking these trips to New York off and on over the years, and I would do ride-alongs here and there. But it wasn't until, I would say, two months before we started shooting. Uh, I was in New York two months before we started, and I was doing ride-alongs three or four nights a week, Friday and Saturday nights always. Uh, those were the exciting nights. Wow, man, just and throwing <laughs> you in the deep end. <laughs> yeah, it's all George. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, we were doing the ride-alongs a few nights a week, and then we were in a kind of classroom environment a couple days a week and doing training sessions for three, four, five hours um, uh, with, with Sean. And so learning how to do CPR, learning how to give people IVs, learning how to assess patients, and a lot of really valuable stuff just to know in life. Uh, but, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Jean Stefan's other films. His, you know, knowing his films, they're, they're, they, the camera is everywhere. It's almost like you're watching a documentary. Things feel so real, and the camera could see anything at any moment. So I think knowing that as an actor coming into to, uh, going to be in one of his films, especially playing a medic, you knew you had to nail that. It, you had to make it look real because if it didn't, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't going to work. And so Sean, I was lucky to have Sean as a partner because he's very serious about. Oh, is he? <laughs> He's an intense guy in the best way. Um, but he was really serious about this, this role and serious about you know, conveying the lives of medics and doing it in an authentic way. And I think we really leaned on each other in the process. So the, by the time we started shooting, we already had this kind of nice rapport with each other as partners because there's the, you know, the performative part of the movie, but then there's the technical aspect that comes along with it where you know you're doing things simultaneously and you're working t together in unison and you know you need to have this thing ready when he goes f you know for the oxygen tank or whatever and so we had to communicate and we had to figure that out together and uh and yeah George and and Eric and and Linnell from from Wyckoff and several others were were amazing you know they brought us in and would take us out and tell us all kinds of crazy stories and yeah a lot of those stories inevitably ended up it becoming scenes in the movie or becoming stories that the characters tell in the film. So it was an amazing experience, you know, where life just kind of, re real life bled into, you know, uh, onto the screen. Yeah, let's talk about that real life that bleeds onto the screen, sometimes literally. Uh, so you guys are shooting in New York, 23 days, real locations, like that can't be easy. And then if I'm given to understand, like you've got Sean Penn as an acting partner, which is immediately going to kind of raise the bar and help you get to where you guys need to get for some of these scenes. But then there are a lot of non-professional actors that you're bringing in. Some of these scenes, you're kind of wondering, like, is this is this scripted? Is this, did, did you just put a woman in a laundromat? And then suddenly you're like, okay, go. See what happens. You know, She's going to be in the back of the ambulance and saying that you smell like you're, you know, Sucking your mom's tits still. I had no idea what she was going to say. Yeah. You were laughing. You were laughing. You know, the oh. oh, I was definitely laughing for some of that. For sure. <laughs> so how does that affect the end result when you guys are kind of running around these real locations with actual people from your neighborhood in some cases, like kind of throwing these wrenches into these, you know, scenes that are probably half scripted. How do we, how do we get that? How do we get that feeling that we've suddenly stumbled onto an actual like EMT scene? Well, no, I mean, that's your process. That's the, I think that's why your films feel the way they do. They feel so real. I've had experience with non-actors, and I think it's really fun. Actually, the very first film I ever worked on, I never read a script. I never memorized any lines. 
I just showed up and was just doing whatever the director asked me to do in that moment and reacting. And so in a way, you know, it's it's kind of, um, I don't want to say it's second nature to me, but it's it's kind of fun because I'm used to it and you know where this what you need out of the scene. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of like you're playing this chess match. You know, you never know what somebody else is going to say when they're a non-actor. And they're saying all these kind of crazy things and you got to figure out how you're going to bring it back to the center and get what you need out of the scene. But, um, but yeah, I'll let you speak a little bit about your process because that's fascinating. No, it's, it, I think it's, uh, for me, it's the first time I have actors who could read the script. So I was kind <laughs> of a little bit lost because <laughs> my first film was Child Soldiers. They couldn't read. And it's former Child Soldiers. I haven't been to school, so they didn't read the script. And then I had prisoners in Thailand. They don't speak English, so they couldn't read the script. And suddenly I had two actors who read the script. And so I was a little bit lost, you know? <laughs> and then... Uh, even when we're editing, after I saw it was all the dialogues of the script, I said, oh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. because you respected all the dialogues and stuff. And then we did some improvisation with non-professional actors, um, which I usually do because I like to have the situation and then, then to improvise, you know, because I think they do better dialogues some, sometimes as uh, we could write. So Landromat, you know, she's a friend of the neighborhood and stuff. She's always there, so I know her. We discuss a lot and stuff, and I say, yeah, let's do the scene together. And she said, okay, okay. And uh, she, became, she came at the laundromat. She saw Sean and Ty. They were ready <laughs> on costume. And she asked Sean, she said, I don't know, you, you, which hospital are you working in, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and Sean laughed, but I don't know if he really laughed, you know? And he said, okay, I don't know if it's a joke. Then we start, the, it, the day before, I said, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm crazy because, you know, it's Sean Penn. It was day four. And she had no experience as an actress, so I said, but what happened if he doesn't like working with her, you know? I was more concerned about Sean, because you, I know we did some tests with her and stuff, it was okay, you know, but Sean, I said, if he got pissed, you know, it's better to have Sean in your pocket, you know, than again <laughs> being pissed. <laughs> sure, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> and then, so we were like shooting the scene, she had like, she wrote, you know, the scene on her hand and what she has to say, fuck this, fuck that, whatever. <laughs> and I was yelling Literally, behind the camera. I think suck my dick on her. <laughs> it was like one of her notes. She was like, all right, yeah, so fuck funny. you. I'm sorry, dick. I'm sorry, line, uh, fuck you. Fuck you and fuck this. Oh, okay, I got it now. Yeah, I'm, I'm back where I need to be. And I was yelling behind the camera. And so it was a kind of chaotic. And then you can, you know, when you cut and edit, you know, to get it. But, and, and the woman in the ambulance, Lee, as well, she's a friend. And we, we were like going from a, a set to another one. I say, Lee, go to the ambulance and we're going to improvise the scene. Because I think m mental illness was interesting also to portray, you know, as a call. And, and she has kind of this, she's very really like tough and uh, she likes to talk and stuff. And, uh, and so she did for 30 minutes, you know, talking, 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 talking. The whole 30 minutes were great, you know, I mean, uh, between the two locations. And I saw her last week, and she said, oh, my son saw, like, the trailer. I'm in a trailer. I'm in a movie. I'm in the movie. And that's the first time my son is proud of me, you know? That's the first time my yeah. son is proud of his mom and stuff. So I said, okay, yeah. Now I'm an actress. I said, yeah, now you're an actress, you know? <laughs> but uh, well, she was great, you know, because they, I mean, because, uh, for me, it was important to also mix people who have, I mean, real people and non-actors who have the experience of life and, and, it's easy to do a stereotype, and at least if you do, you know, homeless people or illness or whatever, but at least they wanted to say something about their life and, and testimony. So we, we work together on this, you know, trying to, I like them because they're proud also, and they're not just uh, playing a scene, you know, this kind of homeless character or whatever. And, uh, and, and, and when you have patience, you need to understand the character of the person, you know, in two minutes, you know, in the film, because they have no dialogue. So you need to the body and to what they say, you know, to understand who is this person. And, and, and that's how we work on the, all the patients in a movie. Yeah. Uh, before I turn, the, uh, turn it over to the audience for questions, uh, I think I probably speak for a lot of people in this theater where you're watching the film and you're going, man, this thing is intense and wild and this cannot get any crazier oh fuck, there's Mike Tyson, he just showed up, <laughs> and he's screaming at people in a precinct, what the hell is going on? How did you get Iron Mike involved in this? Well, why not, no? Why, why not ask me, but I'm no, just saying, like... <laughs> no, Mike is from Bronzeville in Brooklyn, so not too far from where we shot. I mean, we shot in Bronzeville, not too far from my house and stuff, and I think he's a legend, you know, in Brooklyn. 
And I thought it was interesting to have him as a chief of the paramedic because he was involved in this kind of tough neighborhood, social violence and stuff. He could have fell into something like, uh, yeah, uh, uh, bad, we'd say. And now he's a champion and stuff. So he, he survived to this kind of violence, to this kind of context. And I thought it was interesting as a, also symbolically, you know, to have this image. Mm -hmm. And he really wanted to do it. You know, I explained, I want to shoot in your neighborhood and stuff or whatever. I said, yeah, yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I want to do it. And I just said, I want to cover your tattoo, you know, because this tattoo is really you as Mike Tyson. And I don't know you as Mike Tyson, but I want for you to perform. And say, okay, yeah, that's good. I don't like this tattoo, you know, so cover this tattoo, it's great. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we have any uh, questions in the audience? You with the hand on the very end. Nope, you. Yep. Uh, Let me just repeat the question in case you may didn't hear it. You've worked with other filmmakers who have worked with, you know, God's Lonely Man in New York and, and that kind of thing. Did you bring any of those previous experiences to this role? I'm not sure. I did have a conversation with Paul about this and about bringing out the dead which <laughs> I won't share what he said here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but essentially he said he thought our movie had a, a chance um, to work for fundamental reasons that uh, Bring Out the Dead didn't. Um, and in terms of, yeah, I, I don't know, in terms of the experiences, I mean, I think, you know, life is just an accumulation of experience, right? So, you know, we're just going forward and we take everything with us. And yeah, I mean, inevitably, I guess, you know, you're utilizing that. But I think I'm not a New York guy. I, I you know, I'm from Texas. And this is very, this world is very far from <laughs> the world I grew up in. And it's fine because, you know, my character's not from New York either. But holy shit, man, the weight of the city, you know, that, you know, the weight that I think we all carry in the film, uh, I think we all really felt that through the process of making this film for real. Uh, because one, you're just up against the clock, you know, you're up against the city, there's an inherent chaos here, you guys know you live here, um, but especially in, in East New York, um, it was, in some of the areas we were shooting in, uh, there was a lot, it was very chaotic, and on one hand, people don't care that you're shooting a movie, you could walk around with a camera, with, you know, with Mike Tyson and Sean Penn, and yeah, occasionally somebody might do a double take, but for the most part, they don't give a shit, and it's great. You know, it's so cool. You can just, you know, sh shoot things and, and you don't have to worry about people staring into the lens. And But then on the other side of that, on the flip side of the coin, I think New York is a really hard place to make a movie, especially of this size and in terms of, like, you know, permitting and, you know, the, the, the different, you know, all the regulatory kind of process of, of that goes into making a film. Uh, it's, it's You don't get much bang for your buck. It can be very unforgiving. And... Uh, but yeah, I think the chaos was definitely a part of this every day. You know, I mean, we could write a book about the making of this film. I mean, things went wrong every day. Uh, <laughs> that's the truth. And but sometimes, you know, I, I think through that, you know, you find something that yeah, maybe and maybe it's chaos that bleeds into the movie. But you find something beautiful if you can endure and and find a way to to bring something real that that those things that you're really feeling in, into the film. So I think that's what we all kind of tried to do, maybe in a more unconscious way, but it was definitely something that was happening. Anybody else? we got time for a couple more. I see a hand way in the back there. Yeah, let's talk about this. Uh, a little bit about the color, the use of light and color in the film, the look of the film, the sound of the film. Uh, how did you kind of craft? I mean, uh, for what I understand uh, of your question, you know, there's, I, I work on different layers on the, on the frame, you know, I wanted to have different layers, so I had some lights that I shot on the, on this truck, you know, like the, the red light and stuff, and then I superposed kind of these lights. So that's why sometimes it's coming from everywhere, you know, because I wanted this kind of chaos with light and stuff. And uh, in a more experimental way, we had these kind of layers of uh, video layers, you know, on the image of uh, red light and, and, and uh, and blue sometimes and stuff. I wanted to work the color as more of this chaos, you know, and I remember when we were doing some ride along, they told me, you know, when you first start the job as a tie at the beginning of the film, you really like disturbed by everything around, you know, all the people like, crying at you, you know, and not the patient that much, but all the people asking you to do your job. And the more you get better at the job, the more you only focus on the the patient, you know, and you hear the breathing and everything. So I wanted to work on this film, you know, as chaotic and, and 
and also the the more we get into the movie, the less chaotic it becomes, kind of, you know, it's, uh, it slowed down a little bit and the sound was really intimate or chaotic, but not really in the middle. So we work with a sound designer and composer. I work uh, always, kind of, on my previous film, Nicholas Baker. We did also Sound of Metal, and I mean, he won an Oscar for Sound of Metal. So I like Nicolas because he's very, we try to do a more immersive sound and more like, uh, yeah, immersive and uh, physical kind of, using the sound for the emotion and the color for translating the emotion of the character. We got time for one more. Let me make sure I got the gist of this question right so I can repeat it for the camera. Uh, the morally ambiguous, morally gray area decisions that these EMTs are making, is that, do you think that comes from an institutional failure or do you think it comes from a self-selection thing in which you're sort of like, we're going to play God and say that these people, you know, get the life saving and these people don't? I think, George, if you don't mind, maybe you'll... Sure. So, I've been a paramedic in New York City for 31 years. I still work as a paramedic, born and raised in Manhattan. Um, so, I speak with a little bit of knowledge. <laughs> Thank you. But, you know, to get to, you know, why to address what you just said about you know whether we think we're playing God or not, but if you ask any EMT or paramedic why they get into it, it's because they want to help people. They want to make a difference, and they want to help people who are in that particular time in their life very vulnerable. You know, we have the privilege of entering into anybody's house, right? They call 911, we enter their house. Like how many people here can just randomly walk into anybody's house, being invited in, and in moments of the probably the lowest point of their life where they're really hurt, they're injured, they need assistance. So, you know, whether it's um, the, what you had mentioned about whether it's self-selection bias, you know, you know, the point of the film, or at least one of the things that hopefully you got from the film is that this is a tough job. Working as an EMT or paramedic on the front line is a tough job. The EMTs and paramedics that work underneath whatever uniform they wear, whatever patch they wear, they're still human beings. So as human beings, if you notice in the film, you know, the character Sean said, you know, I was working one job, doing double shift, and then going to work during the day. You know, that's the reality of what happens to a lot of EMTs and paramedics. They have to work more than one job uh, here in New York City because they, the salaries that they make is not enough. So they have to do that to make ends meet. There are EMTs that are in Section 8 getting uh, benefits from the city. They just don't get enough to make it on one salary. Um, and so the, what, what ends up happening is they get stressed. They get burnt out. Uh, during COVID, you know, no EMT or paramedic had the luxury of working remote, right? Makes sense, right? We actually worked harder. We got people from their homes, from wherever they were, brought them to the hospitals. In New York City, the call volume here in New York City usually is around 4,500 calls per day. People call 911 for medical reasons. During COVID, it was over 7,200. So it crashed the system. It crashed the system so much, bless you, that it's just in my nature, bless you. <laughs> it's the fact that they had New York City, one of the biggest systems in the country, maybe the world, that handles about 1.8 million calls a year, broke down and they needed to ask for help. So probably a lot of you didn't notice it, during those first two months of March of 2020 or through May, because you were at home. Lockdown, right? But there were ambulances from other parts of the country that came to help New York City EMS. So you saw ambulances from Texas, from Illinois, from California, running around the city, taking patients or helping patients who were calling 911 because New York City could handle it. You know, they sent 500 ambulances and about 1,500 EMTs and paramedics to New York City for two months, part of a pre-established disaster planning FEMA pre-negotiated contract to do that. Um, so to get back to your question, no, we don't feel that we're playing God. We're just trying to do the best that we can, but eventually that does take a toll. And so the whole point of this was to show people, show the public that doing this kind of job, if you don't know how to take care of yourself or ask for help, it can lead to very bad consequences as we saw in the film. And we have New York City, you may not know this, but New York, all over the country, there are a greater number of suicides 
than people that die in line of duty deaths. And that is for police, fire, and EMS. New York City has lost over 16 people, EMTs and paramedics, in the last few years stra uh, straight from suicide. So I don't think those are people trying to play God. That's just being human. And they just, they just don't ask for help. So one of the things we're hoping that the film does is kind of educate the public, raise awareness about that mental health is an important issue in these frontline providers. So. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you guys for sticking around. Thank you.